Hi guys, welcome back, welcome back. Um, this for me is uh, bittersweet because at this moment, I can't show you guys how pleasant it looks outside, right? So I wanted to make sure I was recording. Um, it is kind of bittersweet because I do enjoy showing you guys the hillside and things like that and the surrounding um the surrounding areas so I do miss that but I do appreciate that you know uh, doing things this way will in fact allow me to better show you guys um, um, what I've been finding in my personal study okay because um, I'm gonna preface this by saying too this is not um, this is not uh, meant to um, do anything but shed light on what what's been in the tour the whole time okay guys um as it pertains to the kings you know y'all have been on this journey with me and i appreciate every one of you guys and and i know our creator does too okay um this has been a journey you know we've gone from figuring out that uh um, there was a way in which it seems that our kings were chosen, right? And um, I think we kind of came to the reality uh, through Torah, not not any forced will of mine towards any of my viewers, but through Torah that it looked like the creator was creating um, a system in which uh, the kings of Israel were to be uh, chosen by him so they were to be uh, appointed by him and whom he chose to anoint was in fact the anointer, right? Um, and we saw a deviation of that in my three episodes about the king's appointment. So I wanted to now go back because we fast forwarded, we did, we went from Saul to David to Solomon. Um, and because the focus in that moment was to actually show you guys how the appointment for the kings of Israel and, and what I was reading in the Torah looks like it was supposed to go, right? And how something went left. And I don't know if many of us caught it. It's something that I noticed. And when I noticed it, I want to give a shout out to Ruth Abbey. When I noticed this, it made me say, personally, you know, what you do is on you. I'm not here to tell anyone what to do, okay? This is my personal journey. This is a Torah study I'm hoping to start as a tribe, um, but this is in no way, shape, or form meant to um, shape your view. Uh, this is meant for you to crack that Torah open because uh, you may get a different understanding. I don't know, but it's definitely to encourage you guys to recognize some of the stories that we hold we need to get rid of. You know, and go into Torah and get an understanding. It, it's there, okay? Uh, one of the things that I did was once I realized that uh, as, a, as a nation, we went to the left, one, by even asking for kings, but two, we went to the left when we didn't allow the creator to take part in how we select our kings, right? Um, that we allowed uh, man to deviate from the process that uh, our creator put in place. And as a result of that, who appointed these kings that came after? You know, um, I'm going to tell y'all something too, something really fascinating is the fact that I think I see what the creator wanted to happen. And I think I see what transpired that was not of the creator's will. Okay, so this presentation is uh, very lengthy. It is uh, about 57 slides long, guys, long overdue. I do apologize. Uh, had some of life getting in the way and wanting to kind of like check and double check my work, right? Wanting to make sure that I was really reading what I thought I was reading, okay? Before I bring it to you guys, because I just wanna make sure that I'm, my interpretation of this and the direction in which it's going in is all rooted in the Torah, okay? So 
I'm going to take you guys on a quick journey. Um, you see the title, right? Would you disobey your creator to obey your king? I'm going to show you guys in here. Last week, I made some claims as it pertains to uh, some her hereditary, maybe genealogical factors, right? That could be playing into David's seed line, right? Not to say, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's not a chosen seed line, right? Because we know what the creator says uh, that's supposed to transpire towards the end, right? Uh, however... Um, we also know what the creator said in first Samuel as it pertained to us asking for a king, right? What was the king going to do? You guys remember, we read this uh, a few weeks back that the king was going to take your sons and have them run before his chariot, that he was going to turn your daughters into uh, perfumers and bakers and um, it was basically going to be about the king's agenda. OK, that's kind of what it sums up to to me. OK, y'all, uh, it just seemed like it was going to definitely wind up being about the king's agenda. And I think we see evidence of that in our kings. You know, um, I'm going to show you. Uh, I don't want to spend much time on Saul in this one, because I think I did a good job with showing you guys that. The creator had a plan. He chose Saul. He appointed, had Saul anointed. Uh, he appointed and had anointed David. Okay. So I think I did a good job showing that. And I really don't have uh, much to say as it pertains to the kingship of Saul. Uh, there were some positive, there were some negatives. Um, everybody's human, right? So I think that's a natural. But one thing I have to say, uh, I wish Saul had listen to the creator. Okay. He did not. We see the episode of Samuel with the king. I think his name is Agag. I might be saying that wrong. I'm going to butcher some names in this episode. I'm here to tell y'all now. Yes, I've been to college, but they didn't teach you, you know, the phonetics of these names. Okay. So if I butcher some names, so be it. Uh, I apologize in advance to you guys. Uh, you might know the name better than me. Thank y'all. But I want to highlight, like I said, some things I saw with David. I don't have anything bad to say about Saul, except I wish he had listened to the creator. Uh, first and foremost, ever everything and follow his instruction to the T, right? Uh, he, he did what it seems was his own will and led the people to follow his will as well. Uh, that's what I see with Saul. One thing I will say to his credit, though, is that Saul did not, I repeat, get in the way of when our creator decided that his kingship was coming to an end. Uh, he did not try to usurp the creator's plan. He didn't take anybody out to get in the way of that. You know, he fell back. You know, he fell back and he had to watch it get taken from him. It is what it is, you know, but he never. I don't see it in the Torah, um, a story of him trying to get in the way of the creator's plan and what the creator said, you know, because once that, you know, once that uh, will was identified, you know, the people and Saul recognized that, um, you know, um, that the creator had somehow, you know, change plans, uh, thanks to the failure of Saul. He accepted, I think he took accountability and he accepted that he played a role in losing his own kingship. And he just sat down, man, that's the best I could make of it. You know, I could be wrong. I could be right. But, you know, um, since there's no story in there for me to really, uh, 100% say, you know, that this is what happened. I'm sorry, guys, I'm recording and I'm flipping and I'm doing this. I just have to give you my interpretation. And my interpretation is, at the very least, Saul, you know, his error was that he did not um, give total obedience to the creator and follow his instruction. But to his credit, he did not get in the way of the creator. You're free to go back and read that story. I, I would encourage you guys to do that, okay? Um, I just don't have time to pack all of that in here. Uh, as a result, shout out to Ruth Abbey. She recognized that this book, our Torah is not as big as they, sorry, I don't want to say to Torah, let's say Tanakh. 
um, the book itself in general, Old Testament and Prophets, is not as big as it looks. Um, I have an inclination, you know, do your own study. My study is not mine to force on to you guys, but if you see what I'm what I'm kicking sounds about right, um, you're free to, you know, do your own study, check and see what I'm saying. And by all means, you know, um, my study has brought me to the understanding that everybody that wrote in this book wasn't supposed to because I don't know who chose them. You know, we moved from a system where the creator was giving us kings and then we went off and did our own thing. So um, shout out to Ruth Abbey. She did an excellent study. OK, I came to this conclusion on my own. I out loud said to somebody, um, hey, I don't think this book is as big as it looks. I don't think everybody was supposed to write in this book that I'm seeing stuff with genealogies that have me questioning things, especially as it pertains to David, guys. Um, I have been able to do some major pedigree digging that we'll get into later on. I don't want to do it right now. I want to support this with Torah first, and then I'm going to show y'all what made me question some people's genealogy, right? Uh, but it's all Torah-based. It's not the opposite. It's not um, Torah leads me on my, on my studies, okay? So not that this is a jab to anybody that's doing anything different. Sorry, y'all. I keep flipping this phone sliding down in the chair, trying to slide back up because I want, you know, I want to be at full attention and attentive here, guys. OK, uh, so, you know, I worked on this uh, a few weeks back because I wanted to use Torah to show you guys where as a nation we went wrong. Right. We gave our loyalty. If you ask me to kings, to men's that, you know, to men at time, men's men's is a, <laughs> sorry, y'all, that's already plural. Anyway. But I could relax with my family. You know, I'm not in a college environment. I'm hanging out with my crew here so I can relax. Thank you guys for tuning in again. I don't, you know, I want to remind myself I might have did this as a PowerPoint, but, you know, I'm, I'm with family right now. If you're watching and you ain't family, maybe this will get into your heart. You know, that's all I could hope, you know. Uh, it, but everything is to create as will, you know. Uh, so that's what we're going with. All right. So you see the title. Right. Would you disobey your creator to obey your king? Decide who you will obey. So let me tell you guys, I uh, this is a very lengthy. Uh, presentation that I actually did, I told y'all I got a college background. Um, I wanted to do this different, but I got to go with what I know um, and what I'm most comfortable with. And this allowed me to bring some of that scripture in already. So I don't have to go flipping back and forth through the phone. So I kind of like it and we'll see what it do, but, um, we're only going to make it probably to slide 25 in this episode. And we'll just pick back up weekly. There was so much to cover in the kingship of David that I have to give this a few episodes to really lay it out for you guys. So you guys can see, some of the uh, some of the alarms that went off when I'm reading uh, some of the things that took place under David's kingship, you know, it didn't jive with um, my uh, viewpoint prior to this. Right. My viewpoint prior to this was David was um, was a great king. Right. And um I won't get into that. It matters not what my viewpoint prior to that is. Actually, I'm just glad my viewpoint prior to that um, of my hopes and expectations of this individual, I challenged them, you know, rather than it just accept. Um, oh, man, I meant to put on my do not disturb, guys. Hold on. I'm going to do that right now because I don't want you guys to have to put up with that. Uh Oh, where's it at? Oh, there we go. I don't want us interrupted. OK. So um, I just wanted to challenge um, the viewpoint I currently have because I never did. I just adopted a viewpoint and that's not a safe thing to do. Right. So once I went on my tour journey, um, I didn't I didn't have areas that were cut off. I read straight through like a book. And when I started reading it straight through, things jumped out to me that I had never saw before. I had never interpreted in this in this manner but I do now, and I'm, I'm eternally thankful to my creator because I think it was a part of me that actually even idolized David, guys, tribe of Judah, you know? So I am really glad that somehow the creator allowed me to open Torah 
and establish my own viewpoint of David without any influence from anybody, without um, any preconceived notions, just straight up reading it, you know. And when I started reading it, I'm going to share the, the things that jumped out to me, guys, that I'd never noticed and things that make me say to myself, if if I was ever faced with these um, similar positions or, you know, how would I respond? Okay, so let's get into it, right? <clears throat> would you disobey your creator to obey your king? Decide who you will obey, all right? Uh, fair use, got to say that, right? Because everybody's got to say it. So let's keep going. I don't like how dark my screen just got. I think it's going to rain, guys. So it did something funky. Let's lighten that back up. There you go. Fair use, all right? Y'all know what it is. This is for the purposes of um, education and research, right? All right, so um, y'all see it. This week, we're going to look at a story in the Tanakh. This lesson's coming to you from the front line. As promised, we dive into the rule of King David. The creator is seeking a man after his own heart. Does he find this in King David? Let's get into us. And I don't like to read per se from this. I was supposed to um, originally uh, record audio for this and just let it play in the background, but I wouldn't get a chance to uh, touch base with you guys and check in. And this feels better to me too. So I may deviate from the written script just to not feel like a robot while I'm talking to you guys, but you guys are free to read along. I'm going to leave it up for a little while so you guys can absorb it. You can always pause it, right? All right, so let's get to the summary of the state of the kingdom of Israel. Like I told you, uh, Saul never got in the way, as far as I know. Um, I'm listen. I'm let me say this too before I start, guys. I think Ruth Abbey. I really like that channel. Uh, the the uh, the lady on that channel. Her name is Naomi. She really made a good point the other day to say something as a preface in hers, and I liked it. And if I was to bite anything from anybody, I really like what she said here. She said, you know. Understanding Torah is like a climb, and as you're going up, sometimes you learn more things, and you may have to chuck an older viewpoint. So, guys, um, I'm gonna be vulnerable, and I'm gonna allow myself to come to you guys and say, "Hey, you know what? Uh, I was new in that understanding, or s still figuring it out. And if I don't understand it, I'll tell you guys too, guys. I'm gonna do my best to do that. Some things are not my area of expertise." You know, but then some things I get, you know, like if you if you uh, if you were to question me as it pertains to like cellular, I get that. But like as it pertains to some of the uh, root words, I've seen her do an excellent job and I really don't feel like I need to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, I've been told uh, by Torah that the prophets can't tell me what my iniquity is. OK, the priest can't. Visions are gone. All we have is the law. And I tell you all, too, I think that the book of the law, when it was found um, by Hilkiah, was it, that took it to Josiah and Josiah asked for it to be interpreted and it was taken to Huldah. Um, I think right now what we have is the book of the law. I think what we have right now is our book. And um, I'm very... Uh, careful about, you know, some of the things I let in and I listen to, but I do like to listen to Naomi and I, she has opened my eyes to things, uh, especially since, uh, I feel like we came on a very similar journey, even though we, Oh, this is what I was going to tell you guys. It's so amazing how she figured this out. Okay. Cause I'm, I'm just getting on this journey as of like three, four months ago. So I am extremely, um, a newborn in my interpretation, but some would say not so much, right? I noticed right from the beginning that he didn't leave the garden. And maybe that's, maybe that's the piece that I get, you know, and other people are getting other pieces. And like, and I really think that right now, um, from what I'm seeing, uh, the, the daughters are really stepping up right now. And I, in a way that, uh, I'm thankful for. So, there are some um, folks that I listen to, and she's one of them. She figured out that, you know, the you got to see her episode concerning the little book. Um, it tells you how uh, 
our mother creator says something to the effect like uh, if they come, well, y'all know this one, if they come to you saying the burden of Israel, that that is the precursor for something that she never revealed to them. So y'all need to check that episode out. It's one of her longer ones, but she really hit it home for me. And it real made me realize that we're on two separate journeys, but came to the same conclusion. Like I literally said, this book is not as big as people want us to think. And she has an episode, the little book. So you guys got to check that out. So um, let's get back into our, uh, our study about the kingship, right? I don't want to deviate too much or digress. Let me stay on topic because it's really important that I highlight to you guys the things I saw, and then you take that and you do what you want with that. Um, but I'm going to highlight some things that allowed me to get rid of memories that I held of of uh, the kingship of David, where I kind of like was like, yay, David, Judah, you know. All right. So David is the son of Jesse. He's been chosen to rule over Israel after succeeding Saul. Uh, as as Israel's first king, right? Because Saul was the first king. Uh, David begins as a champion of the creator and Israel. He wins wars and multiple conquests in the name of the nation. Um, yeah, and even in the name of the creator at the time, right? Because I can't take these things away from David, right? He's initially beloved of the people and the creator. However, he's not without his fair share of human fallacy. David goes from champion of the people to adulterer. The kingdom is under the rule of a man at war against his own son. Let's read why he's at war, guys. Okay, I will never take, somehow what I see happen is this, that David, I last episode said that David operated in a, in a under fear, plausible deniability, and conflict avoidance, right? And that was not how initially David started out. David was the one that went for his uh, sling and a stone and took out Goliath, okay? But somehow he went from that to, and I'll just share some of the things with you guys, and you guys can come up with your own assumption. I came up with mine, and um, but let's, let's go, let's go. All right. This is the uh, situation concerning David's sons, because I briefly touched on the fact that David is at war with his son. All right. So I am in. Let's see, I did a really bad job of uh, highlighting where exactly I'm at. But I want. Oh, oh I love that I turned right to that because I was going to share that with you guys of uh, what. David is called, but we are in 2 Samuel, and let's go to this situation. Let's get to the situation. Oh, I made a mistake and got into 1 Samuel. I went too far. Let's go back, because this is the situation with... Um, this is the situation with David and his son, uh, Absalom, okay? So I want to get to what sparked this situation off, okay? And uh, I want to specifically make sure that I tell you guys what chapter I'm in, all right? Okay, because yes, this is the situation with um, mm, I did a really bad job of of um, remembering to record <laughs> all of these uh, all of this lengthy process that I did for this uh, presentation. Right, you would think. Uh, Oh, that's where David is showing kindness to the house of Saul, but that's not what I want to read. I know it's uh, verse 17, but I want to give you the exact chapter. So I want to line that up with the exact scripture. So I'm going to follow along in my uh, Tanakh. And I would just say that I want you guys to do the same thing. Okay. Oh, there's, you know what? I'm going to flag that because at some point I do want to go back to the episode of David and the situation with um, 
Bathsheba, right? Because at some point we do have to get into that. I have already told you that at this point, um, David is considered an adulterer. Okay. Ah, here we go. This is going to be chapter 14 and, uh, 17. So we're in second Kings, uh, No, not quite. I think we're a little bit past that because I wanted to bring in here. I have to bring in here that you guys, um, Tamar, here we go. We're in chapter 13. So we're in second Samuel 13. And, um, I think this is noteworthy, right? So this is why I start here. It had something to do with Tamar. So let's go ahead and, um, read it. Then he called a servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me, and bolt the door after her. And she had a garment of diverse colors upon her, for which such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door. He bolted the door after her, and Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of diverse colors. Um, that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. And Absalom, her brother said to her, have Amnon, thy brother been with thee, but hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard all these things, he was very wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers. Here go a name I'm going to mess up, but look who it starts with, Baal, Baal Hazor. When, um, sorry, which is beside Ephraim and Absalom invited all. Let's keep on going. Um, oh, did I go too far? Invited all the uh, king's uh, sons, I believe. And Absalom and the king's, oh, Absalom came to the king and said, well, no, I want to give y'all that full interpretation. So I might have skipped a, might have skipped a slide there. I hope I didn't. Okay, let's go ahead. I'm going to go to my Berean real quick, and then I'll come back over here because I might have skipped the scripture here. And Absalom, uh, Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, this is 22, neither good nor evil, for Absalom hated Amnon. And it came to be after two years that Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal-Hatzor, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the sons of the sovereign. That's what I kind of messed up. And Absalom came to the sovereign and said, okay, that was 24. Now I'm going to come back to 25 because I clearly skipped one, guys. I'm sorry. And the king said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all now go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him. How be it? He would not go, but blessed him. And said, Absalom, if not, pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? But Absalom pressed him, and he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. And the servant of Absalom did unto Amnon and as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man got him up upon his mule and fled. Okay. And it came to pass while they were in the way that tidings came to David saying, Absalom have slain all the king's son and there's not one of them left. Then the king arose and tore his garments and laid on the earth and all his servants stood by with their clothes rent. And uh, Jochebed, the son of Shimnia, David's brother, I'm telling you these names, answered and uh and said, hold on, I got to make this, okay, um, let's see, where was we at, I had to enlarge that, guys, because I can barely see the writing, 
And Yonabad, the son of Shimea, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my lord suppose that they have all that they have slain all the young men, the king's son. For Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this had been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Now, therefore, let my not let. Sorry, I'm tearing that up. Now, therefore, the King James does this old English that just it doesn't really flow so well. So you got to sometimes stop yourself and figure what they're trying to say here. Mm. Now, therefore, let not my king, the king, let not my lord, the king, take the thing to his heart to think that all the king's sons are dead. For Amnon only is dead. But Absalom fled. And the young man that kept the watch, lift up his eyes and look, and behold, there came much people by the way of the hillside behind behind him. And Jonah bade son unto the king, behold, the king's sons come as thy servant. Sons. Uh, and Jacob has said unto the king, uh, bless Gavin, he done came over here to bring me a granola, guy, granola bar, guys. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Gavin. And Yochabah said unto the king, Behold, the king's son come, as thy servant said, so it is. So David finds out that um, initially he thought all of his sons had been killed. Sorry about the flipping guys. Uh, but then he finds out that they are not, in fact, all dead, that it's Amnon that has been killed. Okay. And it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of speaking that, behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also, and uh, all his servants wept very sore. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amahud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. So it seems like here that they're even telling us that I don't know if Amnon was a problem child, uh, but it says here that David was comforted concerning that he was dead. Um, I don't know what led to that sentence. But let's just keep moving along. And, you know, I may share and I may not, but that's a very... Uh, powerful statement right there to me. So let's move along. Um, so I say here, let's summarize what we've read. Absalom's sister is sexually assaulted by her half-brother. Okay, this is Tamar. This is David's daughter as well. She had on a coat of many colors. She is in fact a virgin. He has tricked her. Amnon is a trickster. He's got her to come on over and um, under the guise that he was sick. And um, and uh, had Tamar come over and assaulted her. Uh, Absalom avenges his sister's sexual assault. Uh, David fails to address the conflict and find a resolution to what happened to Tamar. And I put here, notice she's wearing a coat of many colors, guys. Uh, I thought that stood out to me. That's something I'd never noticed, but it, it led me on another journey, let's just say that, especially as it pertained to Ezekiel 17. Okay, that's all I can say on that. Uh, and, and okay, lastly, Absalom has fled. Okay, Absalom has fled after he's, uh, as it says in Torah, he's been gone for three years. Uh, and some of this I'm going to speed through just to kind of get you guys to some of the some of the major issues that I have with this story. But at any time you guys want to go back, like I said, this is the Sam, this is the story in second Samuel. Um, it all starts, looks like this story specifically, uh, <laughs> you know, it would, be, it would behove you guys to go back to second Samuel 11, uh, specifically, but at some point, but this one is specifically under, uh, second Samuel, uh, I'm going to say 13. Yeah. Okay. That you guys should uh, definitely check into that story. All right. So let's move around. Let's move along. We done summarize what we just read there. Off to the next slide. Um, so now I'm in 2 Samuel 16, 5 and 14. Okay. 
This is a really interesting story, okay? Because, like I said, I need you guys to go back and read all of the things that transpire at the start of this war with Absalom, um, in the middle, and all that great stuff. But I got to bring you guys right here for a specific reason, because like I said, I had never really read this story before. So I see some things that occur with David right here that threw me for a loop. So let me share with you guys. Uh, 2 Samuel 16, 5 through 14. And when King David came to Barum, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei. <laughs> Y'all yeah, don't want to know what I used to remind me of it of this guy's name. I've been working on his name and shimmy, shimmy, yeah, shimmy, yeah, shimmy, yeah. So we're going with shimmy, yeah. All right. If y'all know a different pronunciation, y'all let me know. Okay. I got off track. I'm so sorry, y'all, but I had to share with y'all how I've been trying to remember that name. So let's start at the beginning again. And when King David came to Byram, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was shimmy, yeah, the son of Gara. And he came forth and cursed, still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right and on his left. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed, come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord have delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son, and behold, thou art taking in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. And then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? My lord, you hear it? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye son of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord have said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? Okay. Let me shrink that down. I'm going to go to the next slide. And David said to Abishai and all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord have bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will um, requit me good for this cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went all along on the hillside. He went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. Okay. That's a very interesting story, y'all. Okay. I'm going to go back a little bit here because I want y'all to pay attention to something. One, he calls uh, David. Um, what did he call him right here? He called him. Thou man of Belial. I thought that was interesting. Okay. Belial is another name for Baal, so that's very interesting. Yeah. And he also does another interesting thing in here. He says that uh, the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. So uh, let's move along. That is, in fact, the first time we see something like this. I know for me, myself personally, you know, I know uh, we were given the uh, declaration by the creator that a son of his was uh, who he did, who he had desired to build a temple for him. But I have my own questions there, guys, and I'm going to just take you all along on this journey. OK, um, because this is the first time I noticed in uh, Tanakh that someone by name had been mentioned. OK, let's just keep on moving. All right. Um, and Samuel 16 actually confirms that David and his team know that the creator has chosen Absalom as successor to David's throne, as well as his band of losers with him. 
You know, they stand in opposition to the creator, if you ask me. And I'm going to show y'all why. Um, David is friends with a man who would lie on the creator to gain access to his son's home and mislead him. It's extremely scandalous. Uh, that's the company that David was keeping, guys. Unbeknownst to me prior to reading some of these stories, I had no idea, you know, um, that these were some of the tactics that David used to gain access into his son's home, okay, in this, uh, quote, war that they were at. So we're at slide 12. So I just wanted to check and see where we were at with this, guys, okay? So let's move on. I think I'm going to bring into you guys the story of um, the tactics that David used to gain access into uh, access into Absalom's home uh, while they were at war. All right. And you you tell me if. Uh, how does this sit with you guys? OK, I'm not trying to influence your opinion, but how does this sit with you guys? OK. And it came to pass when Hushai, the archite, David's friend, was come unto Absalom, the Hushai. And uh, he said unto Absalom, God save the king. God save the king. Okay. And Absalom says to Hushai, is this thy kindness to thy friend? Why went thou not with, my, with thy friend? So Absalom saying to him, like, you know, you've been hanging out with my dad. So why are you over here? You know, how, do, how are you repaying my dad by being over here with me? You know, you're supposed to be loyal to your friend is what Absalom saying, right? You know, Absalom, I'm not here to say that Absalom um, did right. But somehow prior to this uh, war, Torah is telling us that he had been chosen. OK, he gets bad advice. So we see the fallacy of man and we see Absalom go from favor to unfortunately a victim of uh, war with his father. So let's keep on going. And, uh, and Hushai said unto Absalom, nay, but whom the Lord and the people and all the men of Israel chose this, I will be. And with him, I will abide. And again, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? If I, as I've served in thy father's presence, so will I be in thy presence. Then said Absalom, Absalom to all oh God, Ahithophel, Ahithophel, give counsel among you. What shall we do? And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, go in unto thy father's concubines, which he have left to keep the house and all Israel shall hear thou art aboard of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that were with thee be strong. And Absalom went with the bad advice he got, you know, um, it was, it was bad advice from a few people, okay? You know, uh, but he, I'm showing you here that Ab, this guy, Hashai, in all boldness, says to Absalom, whom the Lord, okay, and his people and all the men of Israel choose, his will I be. And with him will I abide. This was just a tactic. He said these things to get into Absalom's house, okay? Um, to be able to give him bad advice, okay? Uh, I want to go back, right? Because I want y'all to realize that Shimei, when Shimei says to David, he calls David a man of Bilal, and I'm going to have to actually read from my Berean because I don't want to have to go back in the slide. He says, uh, the creators brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you've reigned. And the creator has given reign into the hands of Absalom, your son. And see, you're in your own evil. You're a man of blood. Um, and one of David's command uh, soldiers, I don't want to say his commander because we know who actually had that right. We'll get to him later on. One of his top commanders. But... Uh, Abishai, son of Zariah, said to the sovereign, why should this dead dog curse my master, the sovereign? Please let me pass over and take off his head. Um, you know, it was a failure to me of them to recognize the boldness, the boldness of Shimei for him to even stand up to David while he was standing there with all of his men and literally throw stones and rocks at David. David is the sovereign. But you know what? It looks like to me, Shimei was a bit empowered, okay? 
um, because David himself confirms that he's speaking for the creator, that Shimei is speaking for the creator. David says right here, um, see how my son who's, uh, he says, uh, what have I to do with you? This is in verse 10 in the sovereign said, this is second Samuel 16, verse 10. And the sovereign said, what have I to do with you? You son of Zebriah for let him curse, even because the creator has said to him, curse David. And who should say, Why did you do that? Who's going to get in the way of the creator boldly and interfere uh, with Shimei? They just didn't do it. They stood back. That lets me know that whether or not the creator was with him or not, uh, they thought he was. And it was enough to make David back down as the king. Okay. Um, Because David's soldiers want to kill Shimei. Uh, the man speaking for the creator, and they acknowledge he speaks the truth, okay? And even in this, David is called the son of Belial, okay? Shimei says the kingdom is Absalom's. And I put a note in here, remember the five daughters. That was a situation with Moses, where in that man's death, his kingdom, I mean, his uh, inheritance passed on to his daughters if he had no sons. But we'll get into that later on. Hold on to the coat of many colors. This is just a journey and my own suspicions of what I'm reading, okay? You guys can uh, go on your own study. Some of this might job, some of it might not. But um, I don't mind sharing. Okay, so uh, I want to speak on that story. Um, Like I told you, the guys were in the in the command of the king, right? You have David at the forefront. David is at war with his son. And you have men that are under David's kingship. Yet, what position did that put them in? Because they also had a creator. And it sounds like Shimei was saying the creator wanted this and David wanted that. Okay? I wonder sometimes uh, if those men had as much zeal uh, for David, their king, if they had that much zeal for their creator, where we would be right now, you know? They heard the king say that the man speaks for the creator, yet they wanted to kill him. Instead of backing the man that was speaking for the creator, they were heated. But this man was empowered. He was throwing rocks and kicking dust at David. Okay. Okay. They call him the dog, but I wonder, but it never seemed to register. Um, if it did, they, they acted without hesitation. You know, uh, it never registered that the word Belial is standing for crooked and that David is called crooked by this man. Okay. And David admits that this man is speaking for the creator. No matter what we see Shimei do later on, because Shimei has a change of heart because, unfortunately, the person he counted out is in his face and ready to slay him. That's a story for another time. I'm not here to judge Shimei's character because he wasn't made sovereign, okay? A lot of us don't know what we would do. Uh, I think, to me, that rings as a reminder of, like, you know, uh, some of the folks and some families that had to sign that that felt the need to sign a treaty. You know, um, I speak on that personally that I had ancestors that felt like they needed to sign a treaty. I I I would hope in their predicament that I would stand for truth. Um, I don't know, you know, when you stare in and your life is flashing before your eyes, I don't know, you know, but um, I would like to think that my loyalty to my creator would allow me to stare back at death and do the right thing. You know, like I'm trying to right now. Okay. And most of you guys are probably doing in your daily day to day life, too. So shout out to y'all for that. Uh, shout out to the people that are standing on the truth. All right, let's keep on moving. Um, David commands his military leaders, right, in the pursuit of Absalom. Okay, so now we go from it being Absalom missing for three years, 
and they are literally at war right now. Okay. I did a bad job of not including like uh, some of the things that transpired because I was really trying to focus in on some of the behavior of David so intently that I just would encourage you guys to go back to, uh, like I said, I think it was Second Samuel 13, start off there. Like I said, it all started with the sexual assault of Tamar, but I would like to bring you guys up to speed to um, some of this conflict and maybe one day we'll get into it more expressly. But right now we are just going to kind of focus on some of the things David was doing guys that opened my eyes to, should I be, should I be, um, idolizing potentially this might've been what I was doing, but should I be, you know, uh, holding this person to such a high esteem, you know, it, it really made me reflect. And, um, especially because, uh, First Samuel told us what the creator told us about kings, right? Okay. He even refers to the king's bodies as carcasses, which when I did a etymology of that, the word carcass is not really supposed to be associated with a human body corpse. It's really associated with beast corpse. So to hear the creator reference to the uh, kings and their carcasses was like, whoa, you know, he, he, don't, he don't check for the kings, guys. I think we noticed that, but we asked for him, you know, so we get what we asked for. So let's go to David commanding his military leaders in the pursuit of Absalom, right? So we're in 2 Samuel uh, 18. I'm going to open this up in my Berean just in case. Sorry for the flipping back and forth, guys. Y'all know I'm tech limited, all right? Some people are tech savvy. I'm a little tech limited just because I'll be so busy in life, all right? All right, so let's get to it. And, um, David numbered the people that were with him and set captains of the thousands and captains of the hundreds over them. And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab and the third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zariah. So Abishai, because he, you know, went, went to bat for him, I suppose, for uh, Shimei gets raised up right here, right? Okay. So is David rewarding people that go against the creator? Never noticed that till just now, guys. You learn something new every time you open the Torah. It's like a movie. You see something new every time. So let's get it. Uh, Yoab's brother. Okay. Um, so we get uh, Yoab's brother. Oh, Zariah is, no, Abishai is uh, Yoab's brother. Is that what I'm reading? Yeah. And a third part other than just under the hand of, good God, I sounded really out of speech just now. A tie, the Gittite. I believe that's what I'm reading. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth, for if we flee away, they will not care for us. Neither if half of us die will they care for us. But now thou art worth 10,000 of us. Therefore now it is better that thou um, to carry us out of the city to look that word up one day, guys. I never noticed that. I wonder what's in the Berean. Let me check real quick. Let's see. Sakaris mm -hmm. out of the city. Uh, supporters from the city? Okay, well, in the Berean, that word is support. Okay, so it's better that you support us from the city. Okay. And the king said unto them, what esteemeth you best I will do? And the king stood by the gate side, and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and the Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim. Okay. Um, and it says, uh, I'm going to enlarge so you guys, I can read better because I told y'all I got these over 40 eyes. Okay. Where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. And there, uh, there was there a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. For the battle was there scattered over the faces of all the country. And the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. And Absalom met the servant of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule. And the mule went under the thick bow. I need to 
Marge thought, of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between heaven and earth, and the mule that was under him went away. Some translations have the terebin tree. This one has the oak tree, so uh, this is King James. And uh, a certain... A certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto him that told him, And behold, thou saw him, and why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, Yet would I not put forth my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king charged thee and Abishai and Atai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. And otherwise, I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself would have set thyself against me. So he's telling... um, He's telling Joab uh, that, hey, I'm not going to do that. Uh, you could have given me 10 times that, but I'm not going to touch the king's son, okay? Then Joab said, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And 10 young men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. So compassed about, sounds like they circled him, huh? There's a word we're going to see later on. And Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing after Israel. For Joab held back the people and they took Absalom and cast him in a great pit in the wood and laid a very great heap of stones upon him. And all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. And now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And it is called unto this day Absalom's place. So uh, you see them slay Absalom. Okay. Uh, So next you see, uh, moving forward, of course, they got to let David know what's going on, right? Now, therefore, arise, go forth and speak comfortably unto thy servant. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this this night. And uh, that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that uh, befell thee from thy youth unto now. The king arose and he sat in the gate. And they told unto all the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate. And all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. And all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us out of the hands of our enemies, and he delivered us out of the hands of the Philistine. Now he's fled out of the land for Absalom. And Absalom, who we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? And King David, see where they they should have actually probably consulted the creator here. But anyway, and Absalom, okay, and sorry, let's move it on. And King David sent to Zadok and to Abathar, the priest saying, speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, why are you the last to bring the king back to the house, to his house? Seeing the speech of all Israel is come to the king, even to his house. Okay, so maybe they were supposed to be a consultant and waiting to hear from the creator. I don't know, but um, David saying to them, like, the people said I can come back. What are y'all waiting on? Okay. Second Samuel 19. Let's zoom out a little bit. And it was told Joab, behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning. Unto all the people, for the people heard say that day how the king was grieved for his son. And the people, um, they got them by stealth that day into the city as people being ashamed, steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, saying, O my son, Absalom, O Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab came into the house to the king and said, Thou hast ashamed this day the face of all thy servants, which this day thou have saved thy life, and the lives of thy son 
and of thy daughter, and the lives of thy wives, and the lives of thy concubine, in that thou lovest thine enemy, and hatest thy friend. For thou hast declared this day, that thou regardest neither prince nor servant. For this day I perceived that if Absalom had lived, and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Okay. You know, it really amazes me that Joab is able to speak to David like this. It almost seems like Joab holds some secrets for David, right? This is just my my own thoughts, right, of how uh, he seems to be able to uh, step out of the role of just a subordinate and talk to David in a manner to me that would get most people killed. Um, speaking to their sovereign or someone in their superior position. But it I, it dawned on to me today, because I've been trying to figure this out, but I didn't get a chance to include this in this lesson. It dawned on me today that Yoab and David do have um, some history. If you recall uh, Solomon's mother, it's Bathsheba, which her name breaks down to the O, but haven't been able to get into that much. I've been trying to research her, but we're going to go back to her specifically when we get into Solomon. I don't want to spend too much time on her here. This to me was to show you how he operated. I have to spend more time on Bathsheba when I, as it pertains to Solomon and the rightful rulership, right? Uh, Because we have to talk about Solomon's background to say, hey, is this someone that, was this the son that the creator was in fact choosing? Because to say that I've chosen one of your sons to build my temple, he never specifically gave a name of this son that he wanted to build his temple. And we see here some conflict where it's telling me that the creator had chose Absalom. You know, like I told you, I've never noticed that. I do now. So which son was it? If you recall, when Saul goes to choose David, Yeshai had, Jesse had seven sons and, and prior to that shown to Samuel and Samuel's like, Hey, it's gotta be this one. And the creator stops him and tells him, I see the heart. So we recall that it was a couple of sons, but one thing Saul Saul had to do, not Saul, Samuel, Samuel had to do was check in with the creator and make sure this was the son that he was choosing. We don't see that happen with Solomon. We see us move from the creator appointing and anointing. And that's all I got to say on that. Okay, I'm going with Torah. Torah tells me the creator was appointing and anointing, and somehow we move from that. Okay? But uh, my next screen is a term that I remember from um, business class. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to bring y'all into that. It's called, and I, I... when I read the story of Yoab telling David to deal gently with Absalom, I say to myself, doesn't sound like he dealt gently with him. It sounds like to me, Absalom had a very embarrassing death. He's hanging in the tree by his hair. He doesn't even get to get down and fight him. You know, like most movies would let us see, right? Like, you know, uh, where is the honor in that? This is a, the son of a king. You know, not to hold him too high esteem, but at the same time, not only is he the son of a king, he's also who we're reading here in Torah was chosen by the creator. So, you know, the servant that saw um, Joab tells him, hey, the the king told you to deal gently with him. So not only does he not deal deal gently with uh, Absalom, he gets to come back and shake David and say, hey, he was your enemy. We're your friend. Get it together. What? Like some rally the troops speech. And David quits crying and goes out to live life as normal. I'm going to take a minute here, guys, to step away for a moment and uh, bring y'all into my personal life. Whenever I read this story, it always hits home for me personally because I have lost a son. I still struggle now with the question when people ask me, how many kids do you have? Do I 
tell them I had three and now I have two? Do I need to tell them that? I still call my middle child, my middle child. When now he's my, my eldest, my middle child is now my eldest. Okay. So there's nobody that could have came and shook me out of my grief. And I just go back to life as normal. Now I get it. David is the father. And a lot of times as moms, we carry uh, more emotion uh, than men, potentially, you know, that's what's said. I don't know if it's true, but um, we did see David grieve for a child. Um, We saw that already. So how is it possible that he can get up and just go back to life as normal? Is this because his kingdom, this, this child was threatening his kingdom? His, his personal rulership where he gets to sit on that throne? Is this what it was? Because guys, nobody could shake me out of that. And I damn sure wouldn't be in pursuit of my kid. Not over a crown. But somehow we see David do this and send his friend who is supposed to deal gently with him and comes back and he doesn't do it. How do you get to get away with that? This term right here is called plausible deniability, right? Uh, Plausible deniability is the ability of people, typically senior official, in a formal or informal chain of command to deny knowledge. To deny knowledge of or responsibility for actions committed by members of their organizational hierarchy. You know, it says, what is it and how does it work, right? Okay, uh, this term came back to mind and I was racking my brain to try to figure out why does this sound familiar with David Pulled, right? All protocols can't prove either party send any particular message. Might be able to prove one or both parties had a conversation with the other. Uh, they give you the example of JFK, JFK Jr. had plausible deniability. Uh, JFK Jr. does not, but could not uh, through, tic- through trickery. Okay. So you can look this term up in Wikipedia. Okay. This is what came to mind to me with David. I haven't had a business class in years, but I kid you not. Um, the creator brought this term to my mind and my memory because it's like being able to uh, deny accountability or knowledge um, of the execution, right? And they give you an example of this um, on the next page, accountability and the art of plausible deniability, right? The term plausible deniability was introduced into the English language in 1975 when the church committee, a U.S. A US Senate committee, conducted an investigation into the intelligence agencies. It described a situation where the president was not informed of actions such as to assassinate Fidel Castro, but in the view of the church committee was was clearly in favor of the action. By not being informed, the president could state that he had no knowledge of the actions. He had a plausible denial. You see how that works, guys? And they told us already that it's usually people in positions, senior authorities that execute this type of tactic, okay? It's to be able to still seem favorable in the eyes of your people. It's the ability to uh, deny knowledge, you know, and usurp accountability. Um, it's a gray area, guys, okay? It is It, it is the the express meaning of operating in the gray area, okay? This is at its best, uh, I'm trying to see what slide we had and I'm sucking at this, 23. This is at its best a serious effort to try to separate yourself from that image of being the person that sent out the orders for this execution. You know, we see there's a term for that. You know, David may be the first person that 
actually use plausible deniability. Nah, actually, no. I think I got somebody in mind. But anyway, he actually, we see an example of him using that tactic. Okay. Uh, let's keep on going. Like I said, it's a gray area. It's a great place to operate in where when you don't want to look like the bad guy, you can operate in it. And I'm going to tell you to see David do this was very eye opening to me because I'm sorry. I believe him saying to deal gently. Look, one thing y'all know about um, Shamar is this. I grew up, I grew up in Brooklyn, right? Um, seen a few things, been around, you know, I'm in Zion now, but that wasn't always the case. Um, I went to some of the schools Biggie went to, I went to, you know, uh, it was the culture then, right? But the culture then was, you know, we might've smoked back in the day. Okay. You might've smoked yourself a little bit of weed before um, there was all of this acceptance that we have now. But anyway, I'm going to bring y'all up to speed to an example of, um, loopholes and operating in plausible deniability, right? You go see somebody, you want a little nickel bag, you know, what did they used to make you do? Throw that money on the floor, they throw the bag on the floor. All right, you pick up, you go your way, they pick up, they go their way. All right, I don't know what that is, but I'm telling y'all I've heard of these things. <laughs> All right, and that was a meme so that, like, if, if anybody was watching, they could be like, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. I just found that little $5 on the floor. What you talking about? You understand what I'm saying? And you keep it moving. Um, So I've been around and I've seen a few things. And when I read this story, it just reminded me of like, like an ability to be able to like fly under the radar and not be accountable for, um, for this quote, deal gently with the young man. You know, that was David's word, deal deal gently. Does it sound like Joab dealt gently with his son? Nah, actually to me, no. I'm thankful that nobody harmed my son because I'm going to tell you right now, um, I would have exhausted myself trying to get to the person that harmed my son. I'm thankful I don't have to have that story or live with that on me, you know, because I I actually lived in fear of that for a while, but that wasn't um, the case. And I'm thankful to the creator because um, things for my son were more gentle than uh, Absalom's death. I'm eternally thankful for my for that from the Creator. Okay, guys, um, let's go on. Like I said, he's dealing in a gray area. All right, so let's get into David's strategy against the seed. All right, let's break it down. I like to come out with bullet points after we do these readings, right? Let's see what we're gonna, what I walked away with, okay? And you, you evaluate these stories. You go back and you read, and you see if you walk away with a similar attitude now, okay? Uh, based on the Tanakh, you know, this was not, you know, my previous thoughts about David were influence, okay? My thoughts about David now are Tanakh based. And nobody can shift these for me now because I've read it in black and white for myself. And I've known people who've operated like this and I wouldn't want nothing to do with them. All right. So let's break it down. Uh, David's strategy against the seed. He sent a false advisor into his son's home to lie to him. All right. And it worked because Absalom, Absalom got advice that stumbled him. You know, he sleeps with the concubines on the rooftop. We never touched that. Y'all got to read for yourself. Okay, I'm not here to say that he was this great person. He did these things, though, somehow after he was called. So um, David, <laughs> he ran so fast that he left his concubines behind. I'm telling y'all, y'all got to read these bullet points, get back into it. Um, told Yoab to deal gently with Absalom. Like I told you, it feels like a plausible loophole. Uh, I use the example, drop it on the floor. Don't touch the money deals. All right. To even, even fathom that, you know, he would use these type of tactics is really mind blowing to me. All right. Uh, I gave you guys a brief share of my own. Okay. Um, Yoab unalives Absalom while he's stuck in a tree. It's a terebinth tree that's actually translated to pistachio more than I've ever seen it translate to oak, guys. So um, David mourns and face scrutiny, and there's no consequence for Yoab. 
You know, I touched on that, guys. He seems to definitely not be punished for just doing his own thing when the king told him to deal gently with Absalom. You know, it seemed like striking him through the heart while he's tangled up in a tree does not constitute gentle to me, guys. All right. Um, these are just some of the things that I can definitely tell you. Go back into Tanakh and get to these stories yourself. Um, what slide are we up to? Because uh, I want us to see. No, I don't want to go there yet. Because I want to show y'all what he does to put. Um, here we go. We had 25 to put Solomon on the throne. And we're going to cover that next week. We've already touched it briefly um in the rightful rulership appointment but we have to include it because this is something in fact david did uh whether it was you know david was old granted uh whether they took advantage whether you know whoever's at fault in it it happened okay i can just go back and give you guys the story and we'll cover that um i think i'm going to try to break this up into a two or three part series i'll see uh what my time looks like next week, next week, next week, next week, and um, how much I can, how much time I can realistically dedicate next week um, to our recordings, and uh, we'll take it from there. But right now, I do want to touch briefly on David's grief because uh, there was a few things I threw at y'all last week. I told you he operated under fear. Like I told you, for whatever reason, he would not address the situation with Amnon and Tamar. That was a big breach. That was a major flaw of David's as the king and as the father. He should have definitely, uh, I couldn't even tell you right now how he should have resolved it, but to not even touch it, uh, I think that that expressly, did, that expressly led to his conflict with his son, Absalom. Okay. Uh, but I also remind you guys that he operated in fear. He operated in plausible deniability. I showed you guys that just now I gave you guys great examples of, you know, him talking to Yoab with the people in earshot, talking about deal gently. You know, I told y'all how that reads to me. You know, I don't know if y'all are uh, familiar with these stories or not, but I would beg y'all to go back and definitely read. Uh, the 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 entire I can only sum up with so many things in these uh, in these presentations. I am I encourage you guys, please follow up on what I'm saying. You know, if you saw it differently, let me know. But um, if this is new to y'all, you know, and this is the first time you're ever even hearing about things like this as it pertains to David's kingship, you know, I encourage y'all to go back and read uh, without any any preconceived uh, memories of his kingship and just read it, you know, raw and uncut. And, you know, when you do that, you know, see if it's jiving with some of the stories that I'm showing you guys and uh, what I'm trying to build you guys up to. Uh, as far as the flaw in our king's man and, and faced with, should I obey the king or should I obey my creator? I want y'all to know what we should do. Because I can tell you what, what I'm planning on doing, man. <laughs> I, I think I'm living it right now, okay? I'm going to be loyal to my creator. All right, this is our last slide. And um, like I said, I'll bring you guys in next week and we will discuss further. Um, we're going to get into next where David overstepped his bounds to me, whether it was under pressure, under a uh, trickery, however you guys sum it up, you know, that's cool, but we're going to touch it next week. Was he too old? Was he this? Was he that? I don't know. But we clearly see that we go from the creator, appoint and anoint to something different. Okay, and we see a lot in the background that I'm going to touch on. Uh, so I'm going to close out with this slide. Uh, it's concerning David's confrontation avoidance pattern. You know, I like to be thorough when I say stuff. I like to show you examples of what I mean. So I showed you the fear. I showed you the fear with uh, facing the nation and having them think that he was grieving more for his son. The fear, you know, he didn't start out in fear. Clearly not. He took down a giant with a stone. But somehow, this is the David we got, guys. This is what happened 
in, in that kingship, okay? Um, we see that he uh, avoids uh, confrontation, okay? When he stood in front of a giant, okay? David's grief and confrontation avoidance pattern, um, his grief is very short-lived. I don't want to touch too much on that. I don't want to, uh, yeah, it was just short-lived, guys, and misdirected and easy to easy to redirect because he was able to go back out there and save face for the kingdom, right? Uh, he doesn't deal with Yoab. All right, I'm summarizing what we read today. His grief was short-lived, and I'm telling you why I feel like he has a confrontation avoidance pattern. Uh, he doesn't deal with Yoab. If, in fact, he meant something different when he ordered him to deal gently with Absalom, you know, I can't understand how a captain gets to take charge and disobey a direct order without consequences. So I'm using uh, my thought process here. It should have been some definite consequences for Yoab when he got back after doing that to um, Absalom. And like I said, this is a pattern of conflict avoidance. On the part of David, he, uh, for me personally, he displays poor leadership skills. Uh, he fails to act when Amnon sexually assaulted his half sister Tamar, and this ultimately is what fueled the war with Absalom. Man, if you're gonna be a king, you gotta make decisions sometimes, and they, uh, you can't fail to act. Okay, David was supposed to act. He was supposed to set order and set this thing right. And his failure to act ultimately to me led to a huge, a huge um, deviation from where we were allowing the creator to appoint and anoint. And even going so far as to disobey the creator. If, if the creator, in fact, pointed out Absalom, as I done read twice in this Torah, we see that Shimei says it, and we see that Hushai says it when he lies to Absalom to gain entrance into his house. We see two examples of people saying that the creator had chosen Absalom. This is the only place I can find it recorded in the Torah. Uh, I got to go by what Torah says. Okay, Torah, Torah is telling me that Absalom was the son chosen. I've read it twice, guys. You know, what you choose to do and believe is completely your right to do. But as for me, I've read it twice. And I question if Solomon was, in fact, the chosen son. And next week, we're going to get into why I have these questions. I showed you just a little bit. But it gets deeper, guys. Thank y'all for tuning in to the front line. It's your girl, Shamar. Uh, much thanks to you guys for tuning in. Um, thank y'all for riding this out with me. Um, look at me. I'm still not as tech savvy as I need to be, but we're just going to close out like that, all jacked up. But you know what? We got that. We got what we needed to get in. in. So much love, guys. Uh, I appreciate y'all for all your time spent on this specific episode, okay? Um, I look forward to any comments or any questions you guys have. I meant to tell you guys I do have an email. Uh, it's shamar, she brews and bakes at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out anytime if you guys got anything you want me to check out or anything to support. Much love to you guys from the front line. We're right here. We're in Zion. We're waiting. Take care, guys. <laughs>